this homework that was due a while back, but as you know from the email, you had an extra week on it. So if you have, if you don't have the full points on it, uh, maybe update your solution and turn it in. I'm still counting the ones that come in. If you turned it in on time, great. You can you can still work on it and get full credit. If you I think everybody did. If you hadn't turned it in already, uh, definitely go ahead and turn it in. I'll, you can get up to a point on it, which is better than no points on it. So please uh, have a look at that. I think almost everybody has, has done that. I've given feedback on everything that's been submitted. So uh, have a look at that and, uh, and be sure you're getting the full points on this. Again, the whole goal of this, right, the university's goal is, I guess, for me to assign you a grade. But my goal is for you to actually learn this stuff and understand it. Hopefully that's your goal too. That's why you're taking the course. So uh, so have a look at that. Uh, the homework, I don't think I need to go through this again. The homework was to use them to build a disassembler. Output should look like this. Uh, the number one problem which people seem to have is just following uh, directions on this and, and, and just doing what I'm trying to get you to do. Uh, so just try to do that. There's the little uh, debugging and error printing tool. Uh, it's unrelated to exceptions. If you get, catch an exception, you can then write an error message using this. This is just a way for you to write error messages so that my tool can, my automatic checking tool will not be confused. Some hints if you need them, uh, imports if you need them. There we go. Pretty straightforward stuff. If you have questions about it, uh, email me. Let's talk about tools. Today's tool is Ghidra. So if you've not, if you've been, I don't know, if you just unaware of what Ghidra is, uh, Ghidra is a software reverse engineering tool suite. It's a whole collection of tools that do a variety of the algorithms that we'll be talking about in the in uh, in this class. It's kind of a disassembler, a decompiler, a code analysis tool. Uh, it's pretty neat. It was developed by the National Security Agency, who's made it available. Uh, it's written in Java, which I guess we can, we can accept it for who it is. It provides this assembly. It does it in the Intel format, as you can sort of see from looking at the listing over here on the right-hand side. It does a best effort kind of decompilation, which could certainly use some work. And it can even do emulation. And it has a program semantic system, which we'll talk about maybe later on in the class. There's a lot going on in Ghidra. Way more than I can cover in a short period of time. Uh, but I'll hit some of the highlights. If you want Ghidra, you have to have Java. So you need to install some version of it. My recommendation is OpenJDK 17. That's how you install it on Ubuntu. And after you've done that, you should be able to run Java from the prompt and see that you have Java installed. After that, you got to get Ghidra. And Ghidra doesn't come in a nice convenient installer. It just basically comes to you as a, as a zipped package. And so if you head over to Ghidra's uh, website, which is linked here, we can find the releases. They look like this, and here's the most recent one when I made the slide. And there's the zip file that you would grab. You would just go ahead and, and grab that. And you should grab one that's after 10.1.2 because these versions have addressed the log4j vulnerability uh, that you may be aware of. Installing it is, I don't know, easy, hard, I can't decide. Uh, in this case, what I've decided to do is give you directions for installing it under your home area in a, in a uh, directory called opt. That's where I stash various software. Uh, a lot of times people put it, when they have control of the system, they put it under slash opt. Uh, but you can just put it here under your own directory if you don't have control of the entire system or you just want to. So make a, a uh, opt folder in your home area change into that, unzip the whatever Ghidra zip you downloaded into that folder. 
And then I like to do this. You can do a symlink of the Ghidra folder you just made to just Ghidra. So now it's just opt Ghidra. And if you have multiple versions of Ghidra, and there's a reason you might have that, but it's somewhat obscure, uh, you can change back and forth by changing the symlink. Ghidra comes with an icon. There's a .ico file that's located in Ghidra support, and it seems to have problems on Ubuntu, primarily with getting the correct size. Uh, there is a uh, description of the problem here, and my solution to that is to just go and grab the Ghidra logo from Wikipedia in this case. So it's going to grab uh, the Wikimedia uh, Ghidra logo, which is, out, which is under public domain, and just suck it down into the Ghidra support folder. So now there's a Ghidra logo.png. Once you have Ghidra installed, you can test it just by running it. That's the line to run from the prompt. That should work and it should be just fine. Uh, here, you know, a lot of people like to have the desktop launcher work. So let's see if I can do this. So if I do this and start typing Ghidra, and I haven't fixed the icon on here, but that's okay. You will have it fixed. Uh, then it'll find it if you have a desktop entry for it. And this is the desktop entry that I think I'm using on most computers. It's pretty easy. Uh, and it goes in dot local share applications, and I just call it Ghidra.desktop. And once you put it in here, the GNOME desktop will find it. Hopefully it'll find the Ghidra uh, icon that we pulled down and all should be good. Once you start it, the first time you start it, you get, I don't know what you get. You get a, uh, I think a click license and some other information. But normally when you start it, you'll get the main window, which looks like this. This takes you to the list of open or active Ghidra projects. So Ghidra has a, uh, a project structure where it stores information about the stuff that you're working on. And uh, if you're not working on anything, there's no active project. And you can create a new project by going up to the, not the project menu, don't be lured by it, but the file menu and you can make a new project there. And you can get lots of help on the help menu. Projects can contain multiple files. I mean, you know, think about a dynamic executable. It's got a binary, it may have some resource files, it may have a bunch of DLLs, or on, on Linux it may have a bunch of uh, shared object files, and all those need to be brought into the project. And so a, a single project can have lots and lots of of files. And once you've made a project, the project will be empty. Like here's a little project called Python and it's empty. And so then I would add the Python executable and, and lots of other information uh, with it as well. There are two kinds of projects in the Ghidra world, not super complicated. There's non-shared projects, which are local me only projects. And there are shared projects where, there, where you work with other folks on and sharing analysis results. The shared projects use a little server. If you want to read about that, <clears throat> about that, here's a site that does a pretty good job of covering that. I think the Ghidra documentation is not great in discussing how to set up and run a shared project. So I'd recommend you have a look here instead. You can import files into your project. You just hit I and that'll bring up the import menu, or you can click import on the file menu and probably right click and choose import off of the uh, project. For files that link to shared libraries, you should click options and select load external libraries that will go and grab the libraries that are associated with it. Uh, and you may get a warning like fail to properly mark up GNU hash table, that kind of stuff. That's most common if you're trying to analyze a piece of malware. Uh, and it shows up as a result of people using SuperStrip. So SuperStrip is like Strip, only it's much more aggressive. It rips out the section tables. It tries to, tries to rip out as much information as possible out of the executable. 
uh, resulting in as little information remaining in there as possible, which is what you'd want if you were, I don't know, writing malware. Superstrip, you want to see how it works? It's on GitHub. Go have a look at it. You can go and, and find Superstrip there. Anyway, it does tend to uh, cause a warning about uh, when, it, when, it lo when you load stuff and give you that's been stripped this way, at least in the versions that I've been using. Maybe the newest version fixes that. I'm not 100% sure. Once you have a project, you will see these three icons. If you're still on an older version of Ghidra, you will only see two. But on the new one, you'll see all three of these. The debugger has been around a while, but it's not by default been present. You had to go and add it. Well, now it's there by default, which is kind of nice. So there's a code browser, there's a debugger, and there's a version tracker. And those are the ones you get by default. You can add more tools. And there are people out there who build additional tools for Ghidra. And if you want to find one of those and load it in, you absolutely can do that. Now, the version tracker is worth mentioning. It's worth mentioning because, let's say, you're analyzing a particular version of a piece of software. And you do a lot of work on that. You figure out how parts of it interact. You have a lot of commentary. And then a new version comes along that's substantially the same. You don't want to start from scratch and have to go through all that work of, of annotating it and figuring out function names and where the arguments are and all that. There's a tool in Ghidra called the version tracker, which is really pretty handy. It lets you essentially uh, copy your annotations from one version of a program over to another. Uh, there's a YouTube video here if you want to watch how it works. But the idea is you analyze a program, then you create a version session using this tool and use the correlator tool to try to figure out how things in the new version map to things in the old version and then to bring over those annotations. It's a pretty handy tool. The code browser is probably where you spend most of your time. Uh, here's the main window for the code browser. If you think there's a lot going on in this window, you haven't seen the debugger window. Anyway, there's uh, there's the main one, main thing, of course, is the disassembly here in the middle, but there's lots of other information around the edges, and there are other displays you can open and add to it. And basically, to open this, you would select a file on the listing, and you can double click that file, or you can drag it and drop it onto the little dragon icon. Or you can right click it. There's a bunch of different ways to get here. Once you get here, then you can uh, you can walk through the file and annotate it and edit your annotations and, and do other stuff. <clears throat> Navigation. So you can navigate around just like you can a web page. If you are digging around through a file, following addresses in a file and jumps and so on, and you get completely lost and you want to get back to where you were. Navigation buttons right here are your friend. They will take you forward and back, and uh, that's great. In addition, much like a, a web browser, you can, if you find a place that you're interested in, you can hit Control D and add a bookmark and uh, type in a name for it, and Gita will save that bookmark, and then you can go back to it later on. These sections, you may recognize some of the stuff in here, right? There's block started by symbol, there's data, there's the got and the got PLT, there's the dynamic linking section, uh, so on, down through here. So there's the stuff, there's sort of the recognized parts of the file. You can click on these to go quickly to those. Imports and exports are listed here. Functions, so Ghidra tries to find functions in the code as it analyzes it. So this is not super precise. Uh, there's different ways you can try to recognize a function preamble. If you see something like push RBP, move RSP into RBP, that's probably the start of a function. Uh, but it might not be. And the start of a function might be non-obvious. There might be things like push jumps and other stuff, right? It's assembly. So it does sort of the best it can to find functions and identify them and, uh, and list them here. And if they happen to have a symbol associated with them, all the better. Labels it finds are here. 
it tries to guess at C++ information, which you can find here. And all that is handy because people write malware in C++. Sometimes in assembly, but a lot of it's in a higher level language just because it's easier. The main disassembly window uh, can display a whole bunch of stuff for you. Uh, if you look at this, you may recognize what's going on here, 7F, ELF, 2H, so on. This is displaying the raw ELF header, and it has the little annotations like E-type and E-machine here. So you can see what's in the ELF header uh, as well as, as other stuff. You can comment this. If you, if, you are on, if you click on a line and you press semicolon, it'll bring up the comment editor. Comments can go in front of things, behind things, on the same line as things. You can have giant fancy comments. It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, a lot of addresses and labels in here are just links. So you can, for example, want to go to the entry point, you can just double click on entry right here and it will jump right to the entry point. How do you get back? The back button. Gita tries to decompile uh, the code for you. Typically, by default, this little window shows up over to the side, but you can drag these little guys around and reorganize them however you see fit in Gigo, which is really handy. So, for instance, up here we have some code. I'm sitting on the entry to a, to a function just called entry, and it doesn't know much about it. It's got undefined and undefined. So this information we'll take a look at a little bit later. And it tries to give you a disassembly of it. And you can see it's not done great. <laughs> it did attempt. And it's decoded some neat stuff for you, right? This tells me, here's this thing. And it's invoking libc start main. And here are some arguments that I think I've found. All right. This is helpful, but don't expect it to be correct. Expect it to be maybe helpful. And the more information you can provide to Ghidra by annotating the listing, the more you can help the decompiler uh, to do a better job. Flow graphs, you can get flow graphs in Ghidra. They come in a couple of different forms and they look like what you see over here, right? Ghidra does a, another best effort job to draw them. It's not perfect, right? Like here's a little, uh, little guy and it goes off this way, and then there's an arrow coming through all these other lines up to here. And surely that could have been drawn better. But, you know, it's, it's not nothing. So I, I strongly recommend this as a good way to look at what's happening in your code. Uh, flow graphs are a really useful way to see what's happening. And if you click on a node, like I clicked on this one right here, you get a little green arrow pointing to it, and it's highlighted. And the code for that gets highlighted over here, which is kind of convenient. Right? So, this is a basic block. And so what you see over here is the previous basic block ended with this branch. Then there was a move and a call. And this call happened to terminate this block because as you can see, uh, after it is the target of another basic block. So it uses the same algorithm I showed you earlier, which is it accumulated this up to the start of the new block. The knot gets omitted as a result of that. Pretty nice. Gita supports debugging. Does it have its own fancy built-in debugger that's really powerful and easy to use? Nope, it uses LLDB or GDB. Uh, and there are actually some plugins for other debuggers as well. Uh, no reason to reinvent the wheel. And if you want to debug some code, you can uh, grab the file, drop it on the debugger, or choose open with debugger or context menu or whatever. Anyway, once you get in there, uh, the debugger is, is a big complicated beast that I don't want to go into a lot of detail about, but it can be really hard initially to figure out what's happening. So I'll give you a few, few pointers. Uh, if you want to start it, there's this little button that will start the debugger in various, uh, various ways. Uh, the common ones are you can debug via SSH. And when I say remotely, uh, you can debug on localhost using SSH, and there are good reasons to do that. You can debug in a VM. Uh, so you can run your program in a VM and debug it, or you can use the Gidra GDB server, which is this funny acronym 
uh, option right here. If you don't like the choices you're given, like for example, the SSH stuff is, I think by default, it says something like user at localhost uh, and uses port 22. If that's not how things work for you, then go to debugger targets, which is a little uh, pane in the window and find this little guy right here and click it. And that will let you edit those targets and add new ones and delete old ones as you, as you want. The debugging controls themselves are hidden, <laughs> hard to find, at least they were for me, first few times I used this. Uh, they're at the top of the objects panel and there they are, right? There's continue, pause, uh, there's jump into and jump over, there's, there's finish, so on. So they're the usual debugging tools. You can hover over them to see what they do. And you can walk through the program that way. There's, there's of course, going to be, if you're running GDB, there's a GDB prompt in one of the windows, and you can do stuff from there. You can do start I, et cetera. And uh, for the most part, Ghidra will try to keep up with what's happening. It occasionally may get a little bit confused and you'll get a warning or error message from GDB. Seems like it's perfectly fine. Just keep, keep going. All right, that was a lot. But before I go on, let's open up Ghidra. This is all very academic. One thing to talk about stuff in slides, uh, but it's a better thing to actually see it in action. So here's Ghidra. I don't have any active projects, uh, so let's make one. So again, shared and non-shared. I'm not going to go through the details of a shared project, uh, but you've got a link that will tell you more about it. Our project directory is going to be Ghidra. Let's create a new thing and take a look at which are on the other machine. I have some malware on the other machine. Uh, let's take a look at Python just for fun. So here we go, new, new project, it just has Python. We hit I. Then it brings up this import window and let's go to user bin and let's find us some Python. Create, is that really the most, one, most recent one I have? I guess it is. So it'll bring you to here. It's figured out it's an ELF file and there are lots of other options, but uh, right now, we just have those based on what it saw. It gives you all this information about how to, how to sort of decode it. Destination folder, program name, and then there's this options button. And I want to click this. And I want to turn on this guy right here, load external libraries. And say, okay, okay. And it's going to import Python and it's going to import the linked external libraries, which can be helpful. Depends on what you're trying to uh, analyze and, and what it does. And so here we go. It tells us a little bit about the file uh, it's, uh, and, and how it read it. it tells us some about uh, how big it is, libraries that were there and so on. And then information down here and you can see uh, it's got relocation warnings and other information, a ton of stuff that we're going to ignore for right now, and we're done. And so now our project has stuff in it. In particular, you can see it has this Python 3.8. And so let's go ahead and open it up. The first time you open up a file in the code browser, why is the code browser so small? There we go. You will want to analyze it. So we'll say yes. And the default set of things is, is pretty good. I tend to recommend just going with the default the first time. You can add more analysis later on, which is fine. Most stuff is checked. Uh, some stuff's in red, like the aggressive function finder. If you just get a blob of code and you can't, you don't know what's going on in it. This will do its. This will do a. This will really aggressively try to figure out whether our bytes that make up make sense, and it'll generate typically a lot of stuff that's not code, as code. So we'll leave that unchecked, and we'll analyze. And analysis is something like like this executable will take a little while. So let's let it run. It's 
uh, we're running down here at the bottom. Let's shrink the window a bit so we can see that. There we go. And you see it's just assembling. You can see up here at the, at the, in the window, we've already got the, uh, the uh, various parts of it. So right now, don't be, don't be thinking that we're looking at Python because we're not. We're looking at libc. Over here is libdl. We'll analyze it. And again, same thing applies. And then finally over here, Python 3.8, and we can analyze it and add it to the analysis list. And these things will all get analyzed. It will take a little while to do that. You can close these up if you don't want to deal with them. For example, I don't want to deal with libc. So I can, that's eh, still working, let's leave it alone. But you can close them if you don't want, to, don't want to deal with them. So back to Python. The little asterisk indicates that there's some work that's been done and you might want to save it. Uh, the analysis results in things in this window being changed. So here is the ELF header. And you can see here is the entry and it points to something called start. So let's just go ahead and hover over that. And if I hover over it and don't move the mouse, there we go. Then you'll see a little pop-up window. High CPU usage. Yeah, okay. Uh, it'll pop up a little window that will tell you what's at start. So let's go ahead and head to start. It looks like start's not been analyzed yet, so it hasn't reached it yet. But you can see it's got a little function. It's undefined return type, undefined information, and you can set that uh, later on. Over here, here's a whole list of stuff. If you want to get back to that uh, initial view of the ELF header, right? It's not BSS or data or, or Finney or any of that stuff. Where is it? right here. Segment 20, segment uh, 2, 1 will take you back up here to the to the top. Uh, imports, lots of imports here. And for each one of these, like libc, you can see the stuff that's that's uh, that's in it that uses. And exports. And again, same stuff. You can see the things that are exported by the file we're looking at. Functions, as it finds them, it puts them in here. You see it's found some sketchy looking stuff uh, and so on. So let's you move around in here and, and do a variety of things with it. Uh, let's see if it's gotten around to analyzing start yet. It still has not. Uh, there's various stuff you can do. Let me tell it I want to disassemble at this location and it'll add it to the list to disassemble and so on. So uh, it's a pretty handy tool really useful. The debugger, maybe less so. Uh, I don't know. It depends on your style of, of working. So uh, if I grab something like this guy and I grab him and drop him on the debugger, then I can open up the debugging window. And here's the debugging window. And as you can see, there's a lot going on in it. It's a lot of different little uh, displays. Some of them have multiple tabs, all right? And you can move them around and, and lay them on top of each other, et cetera. And so this is Python. If I want to run it, I need to start it. And you can see up here, oh, there's the default one I mentioned. And again, if you want to change these, here is the magic button to click. And it's not, there's no way in which it's obvious that that's the button you should click. So, all right, so let's go back up here and we can start it locally. You see it starts a uh, little server for uh, Ghidra and GDB to communicate. And then after a few moments, we get a little temporary breakpoint set up in main. It's not gonna find a main because Python didn't have one. And eventually we get the GDB prompt right here and if we click over to registers, you can see the registers listed here. And you'll notice there are a lot of them. There are some you probably, we haven't covered or talked about, uh, but there are a lot of registers, a lot of XMM registers. Uh, there's the global descriptor table, uh, so on. Lots of information in here for you. All right, don't want to go through all this. Uh, here are the controls for debugging. Feel free to play with this. It's a lot <laughs> to deal with. Just be aware of that. All right. 
go ahead and kill that off. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about slicing, program slicing. So program slicing is a technique for simplifying a program to make your analysis easier. That's basically what it is. I, I am looking at a ton of different instructions or a ton of different lines of code, and I want to know something. Uh, like I want to know the, the value of a variable at a given location, or I want to know, is this branch taken or not? And so how do I know if the branch is taken? Well, I need to know if the zero flag is set, for instance. So I need to know the zero flag at that point. So a combination of a location in the program's execution and the thing I want to know at that location is called a slicing criteria. And if I, let's say I want to know if the zero flag is set at this position. To figure that out, I don't need to know everything about the program I need to know just the local stuff there. And which parts of that local stuff I need to know, that is called a program slice. It's the, it's the piece of program I have to actually think about uh, in order to do it. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who basically formalized the notion of slicing, but uh, uh, he didn't invent it. It was something that programmers have been doing forever. Right? When you want to figure something out, you look back to the code and figure out what happened. He just sort of formalized it uh, and, uh, and gave it a name. Uh, I will point out there's a little uh, overview of program slicing over here that's a decent introduction to it. Not terribly technical, uh, pretty good. There's forward and backward slicing. And the idea, again, is I have a slicing criteria. I have a value of a variable at some location. And maybe I want to know all the statements that have an effect on the slicing criteria. So all the instructions that can change or modify the value that I see at that point in the program. That would be a backward slice, right? Because I'm talking about things that happened in the past that affect the value I'm looking at right now. A forward slice is a little different. I let's say I have the value of a variable at a location of the program now, and I want to know what's going to be affected by it as the program continues evolving. That's forward slice. We're gonna focus on backward slicing in this class. Uh, forward slicing is still a thing. Uh, Ghidra will try to generate backward and forward slices for you in its decompilation view. And it does, a job of it, <laughs> I don't know if I call it good, but it, it does it, uh, and that can be pretty handy. Static and dynamic slicing. This is basically what information do I have available to me when I construct the slice. A static slice relies on the, the program itself without reference to actual values or of the variables themselves. So, I see that X had one added to it. Okay, all I know is that, that this may have changed X, and so that may be important. A dynamic slice uses the values stored in the variables to inform the slice. So over here, maybe I can get a pretty good slice of the program. On this side, I know something specific about a particular execution, and that may give me a much better slice in the sense that I have a lot less to look at. We'll see both of those. So before we get into how we might do this in a more formal way, let's sort of do an intuitive job of looking at slicing. So here we go. Here's a super complicated piece of C code over here on the left. And we would like to know the value of Z after this line executes, okay? And, and as with live variable analysis, et cetera, we're talking about after a line executes or before a line executes. It doesn't make much sense to say what happens at that line, right? Because that line describes a series of operations. And it makes more sense to say, here's a stable state before that action happens. And then here's a stable state after that action happens. And that's actually uh, 
uh, enshrined in the CE standard. So it makes sense to talk about before and, and after, but you know, we'll highlight a line and, and we'll we'll do the best we can. So what is what is Z? We reach this point and we add X and Y. Well, to figure that out, we would need to know X and Y, right? We need to know those two. Do we need to know Z? Probably not, because its value is being overwritten by the sum of X and Y. Okay, so we can go back and we have this previous line, R gets X. Do we care about R? No, so we probably don't care about this line, right? This is not setting something that we care about. It mentions X and we care about X because Z depends on it, but we don't care about that line. If I were trying to look at this piece of code and figure out what Z was, I would feel confident in ignoring that line. So we go back another line, oh, there's Z. But I know that Z only depends on X and Y. And so that's not X or Y. So I don't need this line either. So I would discard it. Let's go the right direction, there we go. And now I have Y gets two. Well, at this I care about, right? Y is modified here. It doesn't appear to be modified in these lines and it's used here to compute Z. So I need to know this. And same thing for X. And so now I know that X is one and Y is two, and I can conclude that Z must be three. And I get that by just walking back with the program. And you'll notice that I have constructed a slice. This is my slice. I discarded some instructions along the way, and I only included what I needed to know uh, to figure out Z at this point. If this program had been a million lines of code, right? I would still just need these three to figure out Z at this point. So that's a pretty good, pretty good reduction. So that's the basic idea behind slicing. That's it. So now that you have the basic idea in mind, let's try to be a little more formal about how it works. So over here on the right, we have a little C program. And the job of this C program is to read the value in at the prompt and then print a, uh, well, first compute a, the sum of all the integers from one up to the value n, and then the product of all the integers from one up to the value of n, and then print those out. So each time through the loop, sum gets sum plus n, product gets product times n, we decrement n, we go through the loop again. We just run until we till n is zero and the loop terminates. All right, so how do we know what it does? Well, we can just run it. So we compile it and run it. And we put in five as our example, right? Five plus four is nine, plus three is 12, plus two is 14, plus one is 15. So the sum should be 15. Five times four is 20, times three is 60, that's 120, times one is still 120. So the product should be 120. And we get 15, zero. So this is right, but this is clearly not right. So we've got a bug in the code. We get the wrong answer. Well, are we counting down all the way to zero? That might do it. Nope, we're not putting zero in here. So that's, a, that's, that's weird. So let's slice on it, see what we get. So the slicing criteria will be the value of P, which is the product uh, at this line where we print it. Right, or immediately before this line, we print it. <clears throat> and we typically would write our slicing criteria as an ordered pair. And it would be the position in the code. So we would need to invent line numbers or addresses or something to, to allow us to indicate where that was. And the thing we need to know at that point, which would be in this case, the value of P. And that's nice. Uh, if we do it that way, then throughout our analysis, uh, if we move back up a couple lines, we would say, well, I need to know, let's say the value of N and P here at this position. And so I would have a basically a new slicing criteria that would tell me that. So the idea is I have a self-similar problem. I'm good to, and, and that's great. Self-similar problems are good because it makes it easier for me to write code to implement them. All right, so slicing criteria, 
typically is an ordered pair. What do I need to know? Where do I need to know it? And we'll as we work back to the program that can change. All right, let's be a little more systematic about our analysis this time through. At each line, we will keep track of the values we need to know to answer the question. So immediately prior to this, we need to know P and that's all. We will keep a line if the line modifies control flow or it modifies a variable that we have agreed we care about. So as we work back, this is the criteria we'll apply to each line. We'll say, is this a line that modifies control flow? If so, let's keep this line because it might be significant. Does this line modify a variable that we care about? If so, keep this line because it's significant or it might be significant. What do we mean by care about? Well, we care about a variable if it's an R value in a line that we're keeping. If it's not an R value, but it is an L value, then we no longer care about it. So to go back, uh, I'm sure you all remember L values and R values, just in case. An L value is the thing that you're assigning. So for example, I wanna know P here. If the previous line assigned a value to P, that'd be great, but it would mean that the previous value of P was now dead, it's no longer alive. It would be an L value. And so prior to that, I would no longer care about P because its value was set. I would only care about the things that were used to compute the new value, the R values, okay? So much like we did live variable analysis where we had a set of variables and if, they were, if one of them showed up as an L value, we discarded it and we added then all the L, or the all, they added then all the R values, we'll do the same thing here. So that's our approach. Let's walk back into the program and apply. And immediately it goes wrong. And it goes wrong because when we walk back one line, we hit this decrement N. Should we keep this line? It doesn't mention P. P is the only thing we care about. It doesn't change control flow, does it? Not really, it's not a control flow line. What, no, but we do need it, right? I mean, we can sort of look at the program and realize we do need this because that controls the loop. This is terrible. So immediately our thing fell apart. Well, let's not lose hope yet. Let's take a look at the flow graph. It's always good to look at the flow graph for these things. And here's the flow graph. And we noticed that we were wrong, right? We started out right in front of this printf and we said we need to know p. We walked back one line and we went here, but that's not correct. The previous thing, the thing that would, the piece of code that would execute immediately prior to this printf would actually be this while predicate. Aha, uh -huh. that makes a difference because this, because this is a control flow line, right? This determines if flow goes this way or if it comes to us. And so that says, I need to know all the R values of this line. And there's only one and it's N. So, okay, our approach is still fine. We just were applying it wrong. All right, so the point of this is you need to pay attention to what the program statements are. I've given people, you know, basically this kind of code to, to do this analysis for, and as they walk back through it, they get this wrong and immediately hit something like this and, and make a mess of it. It's not where you're going, you're going here, all right. So we have this line. Again, n is an R value in the line. There are no L values, nothing is assigned by this line, but n is an R value in a line that modifies control flow. So it is now in the list of things we care about right here. Variables we care about, n and p. Great. What's the previous node to this? We go back to control flow. We go walking backward, we'll find probably this guy right here. So sure enough, we go in here, we can now walk back into the body of the loop and we have this 
uh, decrement of n. n is one of the variables we care about. It is an L value here. It's being assigned. So we discard it from the set. And we add all the R values, all the things that its new value depends on. Its new value depends on N. So N is rescued. It goes back into our set. And so once again, we care about N and P. Continue walking backward. P gets P times N. So again, P is an L value. But it's also an implicit R value here, right? P gets P times N. So P remains in the set. N is already in the set, so there's no change. We care about N and P. And since this set's something we care about, we keep it. Same thing for this. For this line, it's setting S. We don't care about S. This does not modify control flow. It doesn't set something we care about. Therefore, we don't care about this line and we can discard it. And so we do, we just throw it away. Up here, we have a, a line that sets P. Uh, P is something we care about. We keep it. P is an L value. So we discard it from the set of things we care about. And we wind up with P out of the set. And there's nothing to replace it with. We're getting close to being done. This doesn't modify anything we care about, so we can discard it. This sets the value in, so it stays in we care about, but it doesn't have a, an associated R value, so, so we, we throw in out of the set because it's being set. We don't add anything else in. The set of things we care about is empty. So we're done. And there we go. This is the slice we wind up with, right? And it makes sense, right? If I wanted to know uh, how I got P at the end, I would have done this sort of intuitive job of, of looking at just the things that impact the value of P. And that would be the value that was in N, the initialization of P, this loop, and then how it gets modified. So there you go. That's what sets the value of P. And that's the, that's the backward static slice associated with the value of P immediately after this curly bracket. And it's actually several lines of code. It turns out to be, in this case, uh, what, uh, five lines. Let me count the bracket. And static slices tend to be fairly large. They use less information than dynamic slices. And in well-written programs, information tends to be clustered together. And the information that, that is needed to be together is kept together. That's called cohesion. And so you wind up with, typically with larger slices when you, do, uh, when you do static slicing. It's worth noting, in passing that this slice is not executable, right? I threw away all the stuff around it that would have made it executable. I could add that stuff back, here we go. And now the slice is executable, if that's what you want. I'd have to make one more change. I have to throw this S away because there's no S mentioned up here. This won't compile. But you can see uh, the basic idea. If I want the slice to be executable, I could go back and, and do the work to try to make it executable. And that can have some advantages. For example, if a piece of code I'm working on, I hit something, I tell it to slice on it, it builds a slice, but it builds an executable slice, it can then just run the code to tell me the answer and say that you know for this input, it's seven. And that can be much faster than running the original program. All right, let's shift gears and talk about backward dynamic slicing. Here's our same program again. Uh, this time, we're going to make use of the values that are held in the different variables uh, to inform the slice. And so we need to know what that is. And so let's assume that the user entered one when we asked for uh, a number. So n is one. 
but immediately after this scanf. And we keep track of the program execution. So if you go back here, we say in this one here, we run this line and this line, while in is greater than zero, well, in this one is greater than zero. So we would do this line, we add one to S, we add, we multiply P by one. We would subtract one from one and get zero. We'd go around, this would fail, and then we'd print and return. So our program trace would look like this. These are the, the, the lines we would execute. We've sort of unwound the piece that had to do with control flow, right? Because we actually executed it. And this would be the trace of instructions that we would get. This is the program trace for n equal one. And then what we do is turn around and we slice the program trace. And again, we want to have a slicing criteria. We want to know the value of P right before the printf. And so right here, one of the, the values we care about are P. It's worth mentioning in passing that these lines aren't in the program slice because they're after the point at which we want to know them. Right? I don't need to know that we return zero to know what P is at this point. So let's do that. So P is an L value, also an R value. We keep the line, we care about P. Nothing that we care about, right now it's only P, is modified, so we don't care about this line. We throw it away. P is an L value. It's one that we care about. It's modified. There are no R values, so we discard P from the set. We keep the line, and we have an empty set of variables we care about, so we're done. That was pretty quick. And so, right? We don't keep the lines prior to the slice point. We don't keep the ones after the slice point, unless we're trying to be executable. And uh, we threw this middle line away. And so here's our result. So when n is one, p is zero, we multiply it by one, zero times one is zero. And so our product is zero, which is clearly wrong. And the bug is clearly the case that we should have initialized p to one, right? Because one times one would be one. So the bug becomes pretty obvious when we slice it this way. Notice this slice is tiny, it's just two lines. Uh, dynamic slices represent specific cases. They have more information than static slices do, and so they're often much shorter. But they're also tied to a specific case. This doesn't tell what happens when n is seven. Right? I didn't slice when n is seven. So you have to keep, take that into account too. The static slice, that worked for any n. This just works for the one we plugged in. Let's talk about constraint slicing. So we've talked about just static slicing by itself. We talked about dynamic slicing where we say, okay, ver the variable n has a particular value. Here's the trace. Let's slice the resulting execution trace. What we really want is something maybe between those two, right? We'd like something where we have the potential to get a smaller slice because we have some information about what's in the variables, but we don't necessarily want to deal with a very, very, very specific case. And one way to get to there is something called constraint slice. So suppose instead of executing the program on a particular value, we symbolically execute the program on a set of constraints about the variables. And that may seem like a strange thing to do, but often if you are uh, looking at a, a bug in a program or you're running on some data, you know something about the data that's going in. The program may have lots of defensive programming stuff like check to see if value is a zero, and maybe you know for a fact they're not. It may have different options for dealing with different kinds of values, but maybe you know that all the values are of one particular kind. In that case, a lot of the program can probably be thrown safely thrown away. Doing that in an automated way requires communicating the information about what's in the program and the variables. And a way to do that is through uh, constraints. So let's take a look at that. Uh, and I will mention, this can range from 
very doable to practically impossible. Uh, it depends a little bit on how much you need to know about the constraints. Right? If I needed to constrain to a particular value, well, then maybe I have the, the halting problem, right? I have to actually run the entire program to figure out the answer. But if my constraints are all decidable, then I'm in a much better situation. Uh, and so quantification is going to be really hard, and probably in some cases impossible. But there is a nice decidable uh, version of this called Pressburger arithmetic that I'm not going to go into here, but that can let me have constraints and then maybe be able to uh, get an answer uh, for the whole thing. So let's assume that n is greater than 1 at this scan F line. That's our constraint. Right here, we just say n greater than 1. And we'll flow that constraint down through the rest of the program. And so we'll propagate the constraint through the program. And that's not terribly hard to do. We know that n is greater than 1 at, after this line. Here, we didn't change it. Here, it doesn't change it. Here, we know something else. If this uh, if we go into this loop, we know that n is greater than 1, and we know that n is greater than 0. I know, I know. We'll come back to that. So inside the loop, we know that n is greater than 1, n is greater than 0. Down here, we, we decrement n. And so the original value was would have been n plus 1 at this point. So n plus 1 was greater than 0 and greater than 1. How would we have correctly figured this out and not made a mess of it? We could use SSA. Right. Here's how we might use SSA uh, to figure out the correct modified version of the constraint. And it could be written differently, right? This is this could just be uh, n greater than zero, n greater than negative one. Those are equivalent. Life is fine. Down here, I didn't put it in, but immediately after the loop terminates, we know something else. We know that n is equal to zero, right? Or at least we know it's not greater than zero. And because of what happens in the loop, we actually do know, uh, because we assumed n is greater than one up here, we actually do know that n is zero here. And that can be useful. That information, as we flow forward, if there were tests on n, we could use the fact that n is zero uh, to inform the slice. Suppose we had some defensive code in here. Suppose we're checking to see if n is zero. And we would wind up in this case with the if with something like n greater than one and n less than or equal to zero. That's our new constraint. That constraint is false, which means this line in here will never run. This whole if then else will not happen. And so we could discard it. We know that down here, for instance, that, uh, that this atom contains this atom, so this one is more specific. And so we, we can uh, eliminate this one over here. Right? This, is a, this represents a subset of this, and so we keep the subset. And we can play that same game with a bunch of these. So we can go through and clean up the constraints and use some of them to remove code, and et cetera. And once we've done that, we wind up with the same problem we had before. Here's our code. We want to slice, let's say, on P immediately prior to this print F line. And we would do the same thing we did before. Uh, we wind up with basically the same code we had the first time through. And there we go. This is a tactic that's used sometimes for optimization. So you'll find uh, slicing showing up in compiler in compilers and compile optimization. You'll find constraint slicing showing up sometimes in the literature for doing different kinds of optimization. If I have a big complicated program, but again, I know a lot about my data, I can potentially optimize the program so that it runs faster on my data by eliminating checks, right? When we went from, uh, right, this test and possible branch, which broke the control flow, screwed up my pipeline, and cost me cycles to this version, which didn't have it, <gasps> suddenly my code runs faster because it doesn't have that branch in the middle of it that messes up the pipeline. Okay. So all that's fine. 
and all that is how we would maybe slice on the C code, but we were dealing with assembly. How do I slice assembly? Well, that's tricky. Like everything else, doing anything with assembly is going to be both uh, in some ways easier because the semantics are, are sometimes a little more precise than they are with high level languages. In a high level language, the semantics can be very contextual. Uh, in assembly, it's the instructions, just doing what the instruction does. So in that case, that can be good. It can also be trickier because sometimes things are hidden in the instruction, like, like the div instruction. It has uh, implicit and explicit arguments. And we have to account for, for all of those as we go through it. So, so and, and, you know, maybe there's opportunities to slice in, in a way. Uh, this is difficult to explain. If I, can, if I could pull an instruction apart into pieces, I could slice away some of the pieces of the instruction. Right, like an instruction that does lots of different things, uh, like for example, the loop instruction, which decrements RCX and then tests that maybe a, a zero flag and then branches. If I don't care about RCX, maybe I can slice some of this information away. Well, I can't do that if I'm just slicing on instructions themselves, but I could potentially do it if I sliced on semantics, right? If I have some other representation of what each of the instructions means, I could potentially slice on parts of instructions and throw those parts of the instruction away. So consider what happens when I do this increment. RAX gets RX plus one and a bunch of flags get set as well. And I don't care about the flags. And so I would immediately want to throw that information away. And I, if I break this down into the component operations that happen, I can probably do that. So, but if I just am slicing with the instructions, I, maybe I, I can't do that to keep this around. So we're gonna focus on assembly. And for right now, we'll talk about semantics next time. And this is where we actually have some help from Capstone. Capstone can tell us which registers it thinks are read and which ones it thinks are written. And it's not 100%, but it's not nothing either. So uh, we can get this information by getting an instruction, right? This inst is an instance of CSINSN, one of the instructions you get back from, uh, from this assembly. And it has a regs access element. That's a little function that you can invoke, which gives you back this access object. And access zero is all the stuff that's read and access one is all the stuff that's written. And so I can then look for a particular register in that set. And so what this does is this, this is, I don't think we've covered this syntax. This syntax is Python and it is a list comprehension. Oh boy, this is a fun way to introduce the topic. So this probably looks fine to you. For reg in access. So access one is a list of all the registers uh, that are written. And so if I say for reg in access one, I'm just iterating through the things that are in access one. For each one of those, I can then pass it as an argument to this, which gives me back the register name. These are given as numbers. So if I did this, I would say like 17, 18, 22. Like, what are those? If I pass them to this function, they then get resolved to RAX, RCX, and so on. Well, that's, that's more helpful to me. So I, I call this for, on reg. For each reg in this, I put the whole thing in square brackets, and the result is the, an array of the names of the registers that are written. It's a really handy little notation. Same thing for the ones that are, that are read. All right, so register indices are converted by the register name method. Whew. Let's apply it to a little piece of assembly when we saw, saw uh, a few minutes ago. 
So here are the instructions. Whoops, I went through and grabbed the ones that are read and the ones that are written for each line. I added M down here to indicate that we're modifying memory, just in case we need that. If something, and here's the basic rule, if something we need, right, something we care about, like P or N from the previous example, something we care about is written, it's an L value, then we need the things that it depends on. We need all the R values, okay? This is approximate, right? If we had more semantic information, we could do a better job, but for right now, this is pretty good. It's a good way to do it. So let's say I want to know the return value, RAX, at the end of this. So I want to know RAX. So I look at this pop and I see that it does in fact write RAX. RAX is an L value, as is RSP. But I care about RAX. This tells me that, hmm, what does this depend on? Well, all I know is these are the R values over here. So, there we go. These are the R values. So I put them over here in the list of things I care about. Why isn't RAX in that list anymore? Well, RAX was written. And it didn't depend on its previous value. So we took everything from this out of the set. We added everything in here to the set. We wanted to put, wanted to put this right here. So I care about RSP and M. Let's keep going. So for this next one, oh, look at that. One of the things I care about, RSP is written. So I need to grab this stuff and add it to the set. Well, that's what's already in the set, so there's no change. Both of these lines get kept, right? Because they, this one writes RAX, this one writes RSP. And those are things I care about. So now we take the next one, RSP and M. Nope, neither one of the things I care about is written here. So I'm gonna throw this line away. At least I assume that, right? I assume I know something about what calling opt-C uh, is doing and I assume it's doing what I see here. We keep going. RSP and M, they both show up here. So I care about this line, I have to keep it. I need to add these to the set, but right, these get removed, these get added. So RSP sticks around, M is gone, and RX is added. Same thing here. Uh, RSP is written. It depends on RSP and RCX, so I add those. RAX was not written, so I keep it. Right? It wasn't an L value. I didn't throw it away because it wasn't an L value. I threw RSP away because it was an L value, but then I added it back because it was also an R value. Up here, RCX, L value gets thrown away. Add RAX, which is already in the set. And so the new set is here. Finally, play the same game with this. RAX is here. Replace with RAX, no change. Wind up with the same thing. So here we go. So I need to know these here in order to know this down here. That's the basic idea. And along the way, I determined that some lines didn't matter. And one way to do that after this analysis is to go back and look for disjoint sets. If nothing we need is written, then we don't need the line. And so let's walk back and do that again. So I mentioned some of that as we were going through. But here, for example, RSP is written. We care about it, so we keep this line. Keep this line. Discard this line because neither one of these things is written. Discard this line. Keep this line because RSP is written. Keep this line, RSP. Discard and keep. And so now we wind up with this. I've grayed out a few of the lines. We have this smaller slice of the assembly right here. And so the final slice looks like this. We increment RAX, then we push RCX, push RAX, pop RCX, pop RAX. So what's happening? We're swapping these two registers on the stack, right? I push RCX, it's on top of the stack. 
Now I push RAX. Now it's on top of the stack with RCX below it. I pop the top of the stack, which is the old value of RAX, now in RCX. I pop the old value of RCX now in RAX. And I can do my static single assignment stuff. I really wanted to see that uh, uh, more formally. So I've swapped the registers on the stack. So what this is telling me is that the RAX at the end is really the value of RCX from the start. There you go. All right. If you haven't been paying attention to the calendar, I have a surprise for you. The surprise is the midterm is arriving. Everybody loves the midterm. Uh, the midterm is take home, open books. If you have notes, it's open notes. Look at the slides, watch the videos. There's other stuff in iLearn, grab that. Uh, go get other books from the library, read papers on it. I don't care, right? Just, just do whatever you want to do. The one thing I ask is don't collaborate, right? I'm concerned with your individual uh, progress in understanding the material. Uh, and then that's what I want to try to, that's what the exam is hoping to, to give a sense of. So don't collaborate on it, but feel free to use anything else that you, you need to use. It's due at 8 a.m. on Monday, the 7th of March. That means I must be about to give it to you pretty soon. As I am, you'll get it next time. So I'll give you the, uh, the midterm next time. The midterm is intended to test your understanding of the concepts. So it won't be like the homework. I'm not going to have you write a bunch of Python code for it. The homework is intended to be practical. The midterm is intended to be theoretical. So the homework is, can you take the stuff you're learning and then apply it to do something? The midterm is, do you understand what the heck we're talking about? Right now, the midterm consists of 15 questions. I say right now because I'm one of those people that likes to tweak things. Uh, and then I'll probably, who knows what I'll, I'll do. Right now it's 15 questions. Uh, my plan right now is for the best 10 answers to count. So the way I do this is I grade all of the questions. And each question is, they're all weighted equally. And so I go through and figure out the points for each question. And then at the end of that, I find the 10 uh, highest grades, add them up, and that's your grade for the exam. So if there's, a, if there's a question that's easy, you should absolutely answer that one and get the full credit for it. If there's one that looks insanely hard, maybe try it, but maybe do something else uh, as well, okay? Uh, if you just answer 10, that may not be the best strategy. <laughs> Uh, usually a good strategy is to try to answer all of them uh, because uh, sometimes you might confidently answer a question wrong. So I, my recommendation is to try to answer all of them. Uh, but if you just can't deal with one, okay, fine. Right? There, are, there are some that you can, that you can uh, get rid of. The topics, I used to give a topic list in the slides here. In fact, I did it last time I taught the class. Uh, it's just a big catalog of all the things you've talked about. So the topics for the midterm come from the material we've covered in class. That's the best way for me to say it. Uh, you're in luck this time because we didn't cover Steen's Guard and Mycroft prior to the midterm. So great, you don't have to deal with those. Uh, we'll cover those after, uh, after the midterm. That's the basic structure of the midterm. Next time we meet, you're gonna get, you're gonna get some time back today. Next time we meet, we're gonna talk about slicing again but we're also gonna bring in program semantics. Uh, and as a bonus, we'll go over the midterm and you'll get the midterm uh, and uh, can, can potentially start working on it.